this and I'll show you how it smooths out now. Since you asked that question I'm going to show it anyway we'll do it now. I glue up whatever I need to route something. I did a box where I need to route the, the curve of the side so I glued, it, glued this up where I actually got sandpaper here and sandpaper here so I'm routing the bottom and the side at the same time. When you route everything you route is not going to come out perfect but you can do the finishing touches. Uh, this was another little thing I just glued up to get, get into a corner of doing something. I forgot now what it was. But it allows me to just do that. So, and I just stuck this on with some super glue, I think. All right. And I just don't throw them away. I put them because I do a lot of hard things. That was, this is just a regular dowel. Uh, I had to do something where I needed to sand the inside corner. So, that was something I used for that. Uh, you can use anything you need to do to sand. Sometimes, if my box is big enough like that one, sometimes I can do the whole bottom with this, then I have to do certain little areas that I can smooth it flat. Now, where this, uh, I left this in here. This route a bit as I'm routing. If I went too deep right there and I had a place in it inside, I don't worry about it. Because what I will wind up doing is I put some wood fill in there and sand it down, and when I flock it, nobody ever knows what it means. You, that answer your question on that? Uh, you do a lot of sanding and stuff yourself, but uh, it's not as complicated as you think to do some of this stuff. And you do more elaborate things than what I do. All right, before everybody goes to sleep. <coughs> Now I need to show you one other thing. If I was going to, let's see. I got a box like this, <coughs> like this right here. I need to make a template for it. So once I laid a piece of wood on there, Say if I'm going to make a template for this, this box here, and this is the, this is the piece of wood I'm going to use. I can actually lay this here. Where is my I need the extra piece. Whatever thickness of wall I want, I can actually use this retractor where. This is not. This is not. I'm, I'm showing you something a little different. I have two. This is a little cheap one that you use in school or whatever the kids <coughs> use. This actually works better than this for a lot of things, circles I'm making. With this one, this, this, this gets in the way. With this one, I can get right up beside something and come around, you know, with it. You understand what, what I'm doing? So when I want to do circles, uh, if this is the, what is it? Okay. if this is the, say the outside of the box, and I want to cut something that fit differently, by having this fall around, I can actually make the same shape, any kind of shape I want to shape, make. All right. Now the other thing, you can use rasp. Uh, I use this a lot of times. To finish smoothing something out because sometimes when you cut it with your jigsaw you get a little place you want to look you want it to be halfway smooth so that it looks what you want to do is you want your template to look halfway straight and finish or curved or whatever you want to do so you can get in there and work your corners and work your curves and that type of thing. There's another thing I use and I've actually used this before for a lot of stuff 
is the little flexible curve. Now, what happens is, I can bend this here, it's not going to stay here. It's going to flex back a little bit. But if I put some tape or a clamp on this, particularly if I put some tape on it, now I can put this down and I can mark on both sides. Is that, all right? Just by, because these things slide in between each other, they lock in. So if I can clamp them with some tape where they won't move, <coughs> now I can use that to do a lot of things. And I can make angles, particularly when I need to make a bigger angle. All right. And if I put a clamp on it, I can't put it on something flat, but if I put some, uh, wrap some tape around here, I can kind of lay it flat and use it as a marker. I use paint cans, I use anything in my shop that has a curve that I need to make a half a circle or full circle on. I did a cutting board once where I, I actually had a metal garbage can that you know comes down like this. I, I did two circ two things, it was called a peacock cutting board where I had the different little colors. The top radius was one thing, the bottom radius, I used the top of the garbage can to mark the top radius. I used the bottom of the garbage can to mark the other one so that I didn't want them to be parallel. All right, so you use anything you got. I got a little plastic round, you know, little plastic serving trays they have. The thing broke, but I used it, I got it in my drawer with some other stuff, other pieces. The top half is all I need sometimes to put on something to give me that arc or the amount of curvature I want. All right. Uh, these are, I'll talk about these. And we'll write a couple of things. I bought these things because they help you in making, sometimes in doing your curves when you're trying to make your templates. Any questions on any of that so far? Now, before you go to sleep. I'll show you this. If I want, if this is what I'm making my template out of, once no, I draw it. That's your bottom piece. All right. So you took that as your bottom, as you okay. in the box, then you drew it on your paper. Now how do you get it from your paper onto another piece of wood to make a template? I don't, I usually, I just use the paper to show you how to draw it. I usually draw it on the wood I'm going to actually use as a template. Okay, I got All you. Right. I just didn't have a piece big enough to do that, so that's why I used the paper. Okay, that's why I was trying to yeah. figure out how you can. <laughs> and once I, now, I'm glad you asked that question. Everybody understood it? Yep. When you cut it out with your jigsaw, don't try to cut exactly to the line that you mark because you would do some of this. Always stay away from the line a little bit. You can always sand it you know, straight or right to the line, exactly what you want. All right, because if I cut right to the line and I got a little place in there, now I got to either make a whole new template or do something because I messed it up. But if I stay away from that where I got room, a little wiggle room to go back and straighten it out or whatever, <coughs> it makes a big difference. And I'm telling you this because I never made a mistake, but anyway, it happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it makes life a lot easier when you do it that way. So the only reason I was using this, as I said, because I didn't have these wide enough to mark everything. Else. The one other thing is very, very important before I cut this. It's on this sheet. All right, I'm going to make a box, see, all right, this is going to be my box, whether, whether it has miter corners or it's out of solid wood, it doesn't matter. The one thing I don't want to do is you never want this corner to wind up, even when it's rounded. <coughs> to be too small to where you can't get your finger in there. Because when people put stuff in boxes, if it gets down in here, you got to go try to get a pencil or something to get it out with. That's what you don't ever want in any box you make, whether it's glued up or solid. 
So be aware of, if I can't put my finger all the way in that corner and pull something out, that corner is too sharp. Okay. Box might be pretty, but somebody get mad when they got something, little piece of something stuck up in there they're trying to get out every time they use it. All right. And if that did happen, and you've forgotten it did happen, before you flop the inside, cut you off a solid contrasting piece, shape it to fit in that corner, and glue it in. That makes any kind of sense? The reason I say contrasting piece, when you look at it from the top, it looked like it's part of the design and not something you plug in to fix something. That's what you always want to do, look like it's part of the design. All right. Did that answer? Well, you didn't ask that question. I just asked. I don't know what you did with top buzz, but anyway. All right. On this one, if you notice, as I say, this has okay. The outside has one shape, and the inside has a totally different shape. And instead of making up a whole template, I use pieces and, you know, to make my template with. All right. Now, I'm going to route a little deeper. In this one, where the wood grain is going this way, as I routed this, you hit this right here, and this, this won't ever be as smooth as the sidewalls because the drill bit is hitting some sap wood and some hard wood. You understand where I'm coming from? So right in here, I'll pass around when I get through. I'll have to do a little hand sanding. Go ahead, George. How many times? How many times do you route that to get that down? All right, I was feeling, I'm gonna cover that. Okay. Uh, what we're doing, I might as well cover it now since I'm getting ready to do it. When I'm routing, I need to show you two things. About it. I use an upcut spiral bit. Now, sometimes when you use an upcut spiral bit, uh, you get some. Where's the tear? You get some tear out like this. If you have a down cut spiral bit, plunge down about an eighth of an inch. Okay? Down cut means it, it cuts going down. Use that normally when you're doing countertops and stuff where you don't want to chip the mica. <coughs> Use a down cut spiral bit and you only have to go about an eighth of an inch and make your outside cut. That way now you can change to your upcut spiral bit and I only plunge a maximum about a quarter inch at a time. Alright? Because normally the box is solid. So as, as I go around the outside, which I'll show you in this box, then you have to eat the stuff out inside. It fills up in there. And I have to move the router, vacuum that out, and uh, we didn't get the vacuum, did we? Yeah, it's over there. Okay. Uh, I'll get it over here. Yeah. Uh, but as, as you do that, then you go back in, you plunge down another quarter of an inch. But you never start right up against here I always start out in here somewhere and bring the router over to your template. And as you bring the router over your template, it keeps it tight and you go clockwise. All right, once I go clockwise, I usually go a couple of times. Then I kind of eat the stuff out inside and I take it off and, and uh, so when I take it off and vacuum it out, you have little places you miss. If it's little small places, you can't see these good, don't worry about it. If there's some big places, then I put the router back on here and kind of knock those off. Then I go another quarter of an inch and bring it over to the side and go around. And I go around a couple of times, then I eat the inside out again. So never plunge over about a quarter of an inch at a time. Sometimes it works, but what happens most of the time, the router bit is down too deep and it's straining. Okay, and you'll notice that the router bit Believe it or not, it does flex a little bit when you put in a certain amount of pressure to it. All right, but it just, when you hear your router, you'll know when it's, it's sounding right, and when it's just like if you're using your plane or joining at home, you can tell when you're taking too much of a bite. Same thing happens when you're routing. Listen to your tools, and you'll understand if they're taking too much of a bite. Now, most people, if see, if I want to route this in most people's shop. They got to try to clamp this some kind of way. Once this is flat, I actually st stick this to the table. I don't have to worry about going through the table or anything else. The first thing that I need to do
I only want, I'm marking this so that you'll understand. I won't leave, I never leave a bottom less than a quarter of an inch when I'm routing solid box. Most times a quarter is pretty good. Sometimes if it's a big enough box, I'll leave it, you know, three eighths a little bit more. All right, so what I want to do is put my template on here. I only want that bit to max them out that far. I won't be able to plunge any deeper than that. And the way I do that, let's show up on there, bud. All right, that's the maximum this bit will go right now. Is that, see in my shop now, I would actually cut that off to where I can get this close to the bit where I know exactly where it's going to come to. I'm just eyeballing it now because this is sticking over, okay? Now what I'm doing is locking it in. All right. That's the maximum depth I want. that bit to come to. Now my router, I guess, I don't know how the other routers are. But this one is, this one is about 30 years old. And it's really paid for itself. In fact, this was uh, the last woodworking show my wife came to. Oh, she didn't buy this. Last woodworking show she came to, she bought me that Boss Jigsaw. Because she realized that every time she came to woodworking show, she wound up buying me something. <laughs> and I'd always tell her, you know, I need that to do such and such a thing. And so anyway, she doesn't come. Now, I don't care what I do with this now. That's only going to go that far. So when I stick this to the table, I don't have to worry about it going all the way through and messing up my workbench or anything else. You understand what I'm saying? And that's going to give me the depth that you were asking about a while ago, George, or somebody about the bottom being smooth. Put this over here so it'll show up on the camera. If you never use two-sided tape, this is a masking tape, two-sided tape. It's the best I've ever used. I like it because it's thin and it really holds. And for those of you who don't know, Peachtree Woodworking is probably the only one I know to sell this particular kind. Club members get a deal. Now, when I'm doing, when I'm sticking the little thin pieces on to make my template on the top, I usually put it in my vise and tighten it up and make sure these are stuck good. But you can put it on the table and do the same thing I'm doing now. And it's fine. All right? That's what I'm doing the top thin piece of joy. All right, but now I'm stuck, I've stuck this to the table. <coughs> hmm? Yeah, I'm going to bring it on this side. Yep. I need to cover two things I didn't cover. Always wear some kind of a breathing apparatus for the fine dust. And also, 
for the ears. All right. I'm just going to do a little routing here, so I'm not going to worry about it. And this is not the best dust mask you can use. See, I got this thing on the wrong side. Of that anyway, I got some others in my shop I can't use because they're too thick. All right. Uh, and it's actually got the wire on the wrong side. Well, I got it on backwards. I'm just doing this so I want to hear a little bit of dust. Oh, and very, very important. Don't ask me how I know this either. I know one other woodworker had the same problem. If you're dealing with spalted wood, period, whether you're cutting it, sanding it, doing anything with it, wear a respirator because there are, there are fungi and stuff in there that really cause you problems. They get in your lungs and they will cause you problems. So particularly when you're dealing with spalted wood, you have to make sure. Well, even a lot of wood, because a lot of this regular wood you get got some stuff in it too that you need to protect yourself from. And as I say, what I'm going to do is only plant it down about a quarter of an inch at a time. You start somewhere in the center and bring the router over toward the template. And then you just follow it around clockwise. I don't need that right now, I'll use it in a minute. I have to use it to suck the stuff out. Now see, some people smarter than me would be able, you would have some stuff come out, come, some sawdust come out from in here. Most of it is gonna be down in the base. Use a base that's wide enough so it's always sitting on at least two sides of whatever you're routing. Okay, you can use a base bigger than this. Now if you were routing something larger than this base, easy way to do it also, get your wider pieces thicker than this, <coughs> or about like this. Take some two-sided tape and stick this to this. Now you got a wider base and you've only made the, the depth that you can go this much thinner. That much shorter. Makes any sense? Huh? So you don't have to go out and buy another big base or whatever. I thought I... Oh, I know what it is. Whenever I'm messing with it, I always try to unplug it. And when I teach in class, I always teach people, when you unplug it, stick the plug in your pocket, get in the habit of doing that. That way you won't accidentally turn it on. And it's not a bad idea. As I'm plunging down, I can tell when the router start the router bit starts engaging the wood. So you just gauge about going down a little bit. And once you do it enough, you'll kind of get a pretty good gauge as whether you're going about a quarter of an inch or whether you're going a half an inch. Out of this I can kind of tell I'm only going about a quarter of an inch. Can you see that? Yep. All right. Now, I don't want to change this, so. See the little stuff that comes out. All right, you see what's in here? Now, if I start trying to plunge in the more and do some more, this stuff is going to tighten up and it makes it harder and burn. You can listen to the router when it starts really getting where you got more stuff in the way. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I want you to be able to see. Now I got this stuff here, and as I'm going around, you understand what we're doing now? I'm going around this side first. The thing that will happen as you're routing sometimes, sawdust will get sawdust will get on this on this top edge and sometimes it'll keep you where your guide bushing is rush, resting against. And so the guide bushing won't be all the way in the corner. It has sawdust between it. And so you have to kind of clean it out. You know, I usually blow it out and do stuff so and that's the reason I go twice because the first time might have been a little sawdust and it's not all the way up against it like a shield when I go the second time I usually get a cleaner cut now I put it back in the same hole fit to go back and do the bottom again. Sometimes, George, you would, somebody, I think you would want to ask me. If it's big enough like that box, I can put this in the bottom and make it smooth. If it's a smaller box, you know, smaller box, I can actually and get all the way in the corners so that I'm smoothing the bottom. And I got a square one I brought this at home where I got uh, sandpaper on here and on the bottom so that I can get down the side wall, you know, to get it straight. But I'm showing you the process now. Everybody understand what we're doing? So this might not be perfect, but I'm showing you the process I use. I'm just going to clean up the bottom a little bit.
and that would be uh, Now, two things I want to show you now. This, okay. There's some little sawdust that builds up here. So the router, the base kind of rat starts riding on the little pieces, so your bottom won't be real smooth. I'm going to pass this around and let you see how it is. And the side walls. And the router bit, for some reason on certain side on the side walls, it evidently has some sawdust between it. So you get a little ridge where the bottom half of the side wall is, is out just a little bit from the other part, but that's correctable. All I got to do is move my template over just a little bit to go all the way down or to use the router bit to go all the way down. And I'm gonna take this off. This is the other thing you need whenever you do my kind of woodworking. Is an old putty knife that you go to the belt sander and just sharpen it. And it's real sharp. And as I say, I always keep, I just double a, piece, a couple of pieces of masking tape I keep over the edge. And don't ask me how I know to do that either. You, know, <laughs> you learn that over years. All right. Oh, but it also helps me, now I got to get this thing up. Oh, when I stick things together, I got to take this off. So it helps me to get between two pieces of wood. I don't mess this up and I don't mess this up when I get ready to separate them. And the same thing when I get ready to Ted, what about working an upside down in a table mounted router that is tried that? That'll work. It still work just as well, do you think? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> the, only, the only thing the only thing about the table mounted router. In order for me to do this, you can probably do this, but you you got to sit there and try to do something. With this, I don't have to do anything but stick this thing down and turn the router on. Yeah, I and mean, your fingers are about that close to the, to the I, too. I, that's complicated, I tell you, I don't yeah. do anything complicated. Yeah. But the other thing is I'm always thinking about the safety part. Yeah. This to me is one of the most dangerous things you can use in your shop. That bit is sticking out there and it will do it would do damage that nothing else in your shop would do almost. So I'm just, I mean, a lot of them would do damage, but I just, that's the way I practice doing things. All right. Now I'm going to take this off, and sometimes you can pull it off, and sometimes you can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Did you make that base? This, years ago, in the Woodworkers Guild, there were. There were some woodworkers that had a lot more experience than I was, and they bought some solid sheets of this phenolic, whatever you call this stuff. And uh, there was a, is it phenolic? What is it? Phenolic. Okay, I was thinking phenolic was the plastic looking stuff. But anyway, uh, they had some base, we had, uh, somebody had a machine shop that made these bases, and this base will fit uh, a number of routers. But, the only thing, this guide bushing, this hole here is made just to fit the porter cable bushings. It won't fit some of the other bushings. <coughs> now I got one that came when I bought my router. It has a bigger hole in it. And it will only fit the bushing that came with that particular router when I bought it. Okay. What holds that bushing in? Is it friction? No, it's, uh, I'll show you in a minute. It's, it's uh, what do I do with the box? Oh, okay. Oh, it has a nut. What do I do with the box show? I saw you put it back. <laughs> uh, it has a nut. Oh, when it okay. goes in here, the nut goes on the back side. And I only tighten it with my hand. Uh, there's one, in fact, this one. I was doing something a long time ago and it, and it was loose. And it's, the bit started hitting the sides of it. But the outside is still fine. And I usually have, like I said, I have a couple of these nuts. And I usually put it on, you know, before I do the bit. As I say, by wiggling in here, I can get in here and pull these things off. And I don't mess up the wood. Now, you have sometimes a little residue. 
And I usually just take um, a little mineral spirits, low odorless oil, uh, use some acetone, just a little bit on a rag and wipe it. Didn't take a little bit to wipe it off. And you always push away from your hand. Don't do that, okay? That's another little trick I learned. <laughs> because this thing really is real sharp. And that one little lapse of anybody that knows me now know I'm so safety conscious is scary sometimes, but I try to be. Because uh, the only, and I'm not kidding when I tell people, in my shop, my first aid kit, I can consist of band-aids, uh, I can always use masking tape, and I have some gauze. I, pry, I try not to ever do anything in my shop that's going to cause me to use anything other than those. I don't want to, I'm not saying don't do it, but I don't want to have nothing I got to put body parts in, and so that's kind of, I'm serious, that's what kind of stuff I practice. And if you keep that in mind before you do anything, you'll be a lot happier years and years and years of doing woodworking. Because I don't want to lose any of these. I don't care how bad they look or whether they hurt or whatever. I want to keep, you know. Uh, but what I'm doing now is I'm passing this around. I just wanted you not to critique the inside because this is correctable. I wanted you to see the process that I used and how I did this. And like I say, I just shaped this. Now, if I had a top going on here and I want the top to fit flush, I just turn it over and mark it on a piece of wood I'm going to make the top out of. And I cut it a little bit wider than the box. Just get rid of some of the excess. Then I stick it on here with two sides of tape, and I shape the whole thing. Then I take the top off and wrap the inside. All right. So I'm gonna pass. That spiral down a bit. That you're using. No, that's an up cut spiral bit. In other words, okay. as it cut, it pulls the chip up. The down cut, the down. It's called an up cut spiral bit. The down cut spiral bit is uh, one that if you were doing a countertop, you don't want the bit to go in there where it's going to come up and chip the formica off. So they use a down cut spiral bit because you're cutting everything out and you want the top to be real smooth. A lot of time, most of the time with the up cut spiral bit, I don't have a problem with the smoothness around here, but sometimes it will, you will get a tear. But if I was doing this, and if this box was say two inches, you know, high. If I got a tear out here, then that box might wind up being an inch and three quarters high. I'd sand it down. <laughs> All right. If it's still going to serve the purpose. Or I would wind up filling this in and cutting another contrasting piece to go over the top. And once you flock it, and when I show you next week about the flocking, it'll come up a lot of stuff and you'll never know it. And nobody know that you made a mistake or you had an accident and that kind of thing. Any questions on what I've covered? Yeah, how smooth do you have to get this before you block it to where it'll come out real nice and smooth? I mean, it doesn't have to be like absolutely perfect, does it? When it doesn't have to be perfect, but what I want to do with the flocking, now when you flock stuff and put your mastic on there, you actually don't want to put your mastic on something that's smooth like a finish on a box. You need to hit, run, run sandpaper over just a little bit get a little roughness so that the mastic will bond into it. I won't get into that, we'll cover that next week. Uh, but you don't want to have ridges like you see in that. Now, to get rid of ridges in that, I can put wood filler inside. When it dries, I can go in there and sand the curves and I can sand everything flat up and down. You understand where I'm coming from? And the same thing with the corners. And some people, when they do boxes and they flock them, because they don't know how to do the corners, they'll put glue right around in the bottom corner so the corners are rounded at the bottom. I like for it to be as crisp of a corner as possible to make it look better. Uh, but it's, it's a matter of, there's no right way and wrong way to do a lot of things. It's, it's a matter of what you prefer. And since this is the only thing I got control of, the only thing I control in my house is my shop. Okay? <laughs> this is the only thing I can control in this world is how I do my woodworking or what I do. Once I satisfy me, you know, I'm happy. If people like it, good. If they buy it, they buy it because they see it and they like it or they don't like it. You know, they don't call me later on and say, well, I don't like that design. Well, 
you saw it before you bought it. I mean, you know, that's just the way I kind of do things. It's, I try to do uncomplicated stuff. Everybody don't want to do the kind of woodworking I do. But uh, I found in my life and what I enjoy doing is un I try to uncomplicate everything I do and to make it look like it's more complicated than what it is. And once you do a lot, learn a lot of these little things, little tricks and stuff that God has allowed me to develop over the years, it makes my woodworking a lot happier. And uh, as I say, I have no problem. Because sometimes you have to figure out how to do it when you don't have the machines you need. Is, is this the extent, the box that you just did, is that the final part of the routing you'll do now on that box? Yeah, I'll just go on that box. If that was really a box, I did that for demonstration. Uh, number one, if I was doing that for real, I wouldn't make the sizes thick. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, whereas some places, the size is a good half an inch. Is, but is that as smooth as the bottom is going to be? From the right. No. What I would do on that, like I said, on that particular box, I would actually sand the, I'd actually sand the bottom where it's smooth. I mean, it's flat. Mm -hmm. It's not smooth like the outside surface, but it's flat. All right. And when you, when you see what I talk about when we talk about the mastic, I try to show you in the hand, hand that I give you, I give you, and then I got some do's and some don'ts. And uh, it don't mean that you can't do the don'ts or you have to do the do's, but that's just things that I came up with that worked for me over the years. And so I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to at least now make some boxes you hadn't been making before. And that's the problem, like I said, that's the problem that, uh, that's the reason I want to do this class. I don't mind showing anybody how to do anything that God has allowed me to learn how to do and to be safe at doing it. So it makes you it really makes you be more creative because now you can go home and your mind, you'll come up with ideas and designs and things you can glue together uh, to be, you know, to do stuff you've never done before. To challenge yourself, okay? And that's, that's the whole purpose of it. Not that I know everything about making templates. I went on the internet. I looked at all kinds of template making and template making. I still, I kind of came away from this just as dumb as I was when I went on. Not that people didn't know what they were doing, these extra woodworkers. But none of them were showing how to make a template for a regular shaped box or how to do something else. I know there's millions of things on there. I probably hadn't gotten into the right ones yet, that's all. But it's the same thing. Go ahead. As far as doing that on a router table, definitely my preference. I don't like using a router by hand. I, I know a lot of people do. But if you put that upside down on a router table, the only thing I do is remember, you know, you're going clockwise one way, counterclockwise up. You're going to be on the deck with the opposite. That's why I said, you know, it, it, it's uh, more than one way to do anything. I am more comfortable doing this than I am holding something on the router table that I got to move my hand because if I do something wrong and it grabs it and snatches it. But there are some, there are some things, uh, this on the router table is fine, but I got to have a jig or something to be able for that bit to follow this. So you stick a bit, you can do the same thing on the router table, upside down, you got the template on there, and the bit is going to follow it. Yeah. So I have no problem with that. It's just the difference in how you do that. The other bit is used on the router table itself when you yeah. got dust collection on. Oh, yeah. It's four ways. All you have to look up and say, yeah, and adjust to where you're at. It is, and the problem I have in my shop, everything is zero clearance. So the dust, very little dust will get sucked down anywhere it goes, but Rob is right about that. Uh, router table is the way to go if you can do it in a router table. All right. But if I want to do it, now the other thing is, if I was riding a box this side, I don't feel comfortable on a router table. That's just me personally. But there are people that have more experience. But the thing you have to do, anything that you're going to do that you're having problems with, practice, practice, practice. And the more you practice, the better you'll get and the easier it is to go ahead and do something. I don't care whether it's shaping on the belt sander or whatever. I sand, now that box is rough, but to feel the outside curve on that, that's shaped on my belt sander. It has 120 grit tape on it. That's all I use. Uh, that's all I ever sand with. Uh, but it's just a matter of you doing what you get comfortable with. And I'm just trying to show you some ideas of how to open your mind and venture out in something that you're not comfortable with doing. 
when you did some of your uh, odd shaped boxes, you know, like the one that almost looks like the violin case, mm -hmm. did you cut the outside, you said, you cut the outside shape with the router also? Yeah, what you do is I made up a template. Yeah, so, you, right. so did you do that the same way where you just go a little bit at a time? Well, I, on the outside of that, no, I use a different bit. I can use a bit with a, I can use a straight bit. Oh, okay. And I can do and the whole thing at one time. But what I try to do, I don't want this straight bit to be in the middle of wood this wide. So I will take my jigsaw or bandsaw or whatever and waste away some of the out, some of the excess wood. Yeah, that's what I was so saying. That this, you said you, didn't, you, you do everything with your router. Yeah, so that this is only... So yeah, this is only dealing them. with maybe eighth of an inch of wood around there or something like that. Yeah, so you're not overloaded. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, it's, it, uh, when I give you the handout, like I said, I don't have, I got about 12 or 13 copies, uh, I think, or something like that. If you need any more, i give you my telephone number, email address, or email me, I'll email it to you, you can print it out. But it has a lot more information than what I covered. I tried to think about covering most of the basic stuff I have in it. So does anybody have any other questions? I can't believe I'm going to finish on time. Really. <laughs> I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, any other questions? If not, I hope you're able to, you know, like I say, take some of this and just enjoy. Try to make some boxes because I don't see enough. That was one reason I won't do this. I didn't see enough boxes being made. And because uh, sometimes, like I said, I had a lot of questions at Woodworking Show about how you do that and how you flock it and what it is. And, and I had some people tell me some things that I'll talk about when I deal with the flocking, the do's and the don'ts about it, too. And, Can I ask you a quick question on the side sure. issue? Sure. I don't care. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, acrylics and wood, uh, drilling under pressure, sometimes just, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes just air cure. Um, will a router bit on, on a uh, like on a punch router? Will it? Uh, I I know that sometimes the coach tends to, to fracture or, or, or shatter. Is there a bit that you would use that would reduce the amount of uh, shattering that goes on when you hit it with a? Uh, um, or is there just a matter of just levels like you did right. here? I'm gonna answer that this way. <laughs> uh, it didn't say it as an expert with routers. Sorry. It didn't say I was an expert with routers. I'm just being facetious. Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, I, there's, 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 very, there's very little information on the internet about that. I just for maybe it might be. I, I haven't dealt with any acrylics with the router bit, so I have no way. Somebody else might be able to give you more information than I could on that. Okay, well, I'll ask them later on that. Yeah. I, think, I think the router speed would be high enough that would probably burn or chip. Well, that's the problem. You, 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 get, you get melting going on if you yeah. get too yeah. fast. And, but but depending on the type of acrylic, it becomes more brittle, okay, and it tends to fracture or shatter. Well, it, I don't know about the plunging part, but as you say, the heat would probably build up to where you have a problem. That's why I would be thinking. They make, they make, yes, sir. You can go ahead. They make special router bits for cutting uh, acrylic. Okay. All right. There you so go. Uh, maybe you want to Google router bits for cutting acrylic and right. get some information. You always use the maximum speed on the wood. I don't have one speed I use on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all I've ever used. I don't think it, I, I can't adjust it. As I say, this router is either 29, 30 years old. Okay. And the reason I bought this one years ago, that was a fellow at the woodworking show. He had, a, I think they used to call him Mr. Rod or something. Anyway, he was out of Canada. And he do routing demonstrations. I'd go to some of his paid seminars and stuff too. He was demonstrating with the Atachi. I was at the woodworking show and I wanted to get a router. And I, was, I had actually picked up another one, they were about the same price. When I saw he was using the Atachi, I went and put that one back and got the Atachi. That's the only reason because that's what he was using. Uh, but I've, I've been satisfied with it. I haven't any problem. Uh, and like I say, it's, I've done a lot of stuff with it. And uh, a lot of times, I don't, most times, I don't take pictures of stuff I do. But uh, a lot of it is just with being able to do weird shapes, you have more fun. And you get more praise. So, are there any other questions? Did you have a question? <coughs> but 
mainly try to think about safety when you think about doing anything. Anything I can do, like I said, Rob, I don't do anything where I'm holding this, always hold it with two hands, that's in the hand that I give you. Never do any routing with one hand or whatever. But because uh, that blade, if you ever hold it up with it running, that thing is turning with such force you can move, you can feel the router. Sound like feel like an airplane motor or something, you know, taking off. But uh, just be safe and be funny. And like I said, think outside the box sometimes. If I was doing this with maple or cherry, if I was doing it with cherry, I might put a little maple strip if I had to glue some pieces of cherry together, or even a different shade cherry between the two glue ups. Then it looks more like a design than gluing two pieces of wood together. And that way, you know, you can still do the inside of the box. And this doesn't have to come all the way through. I was just showing you how you can do it with a different shape. You can actually go all the way down to where your bottom is. You know, where the thickness you want the bottom to be. And if you had to do a little sanding in the corners, make you up somewhere you can get on there and sand the bottom flat. And you still can do a solid piece of wood to where it has a bottom like this. That, that makes any sense? All right. So with that, I hope you enjoyed it. And Thank you. And we'll see you in two weeks.